workshop um, at the summit, Solidarity Summit in Hamburg now. Um, and we will have an opinion forming process right now and maybe we will find um, critical positions, positions at all out of your um, experience before or just uh, your what of what you have heard here. And um, yeah, it's so that we have planned this uh, workshop um, for different reasons and, and I just introduce you the program a little bit. Um, I'm, or my, myself, I'm Falk Schlegel. Um, my name is uh, not so important, <laughs> but um, I'm a free jo freelance journalist and uh, we're making the project together with the uh, Intercultural Migrant Integration Center, which uh, is very um, well known also in Hamburg. And um, Sylvaina Gerlich is the chair lady of um, the um, Intercultural Migrant Center and will introduce it right now. Thank you. Of course, your name is very important. <laughs> and everyone's name is also important. Yes, I'm Silvana Gelish from IMEC. IMEC is, is uh, IMEC means Intercultural Migrant Integration Center. And uh, we're here in Hamburg since 2008. And 2010, we're very active. <laughs> helping the migrant situation and everyone is welcome to us. For instance, the people of the African um, continent, mostly when they have problems, they used to come with that because we cooperate, we cooperate with lawyers and doctors and we do our best to help them in any way that they can, as well as the parents, the youth and everyone, I mean anybody. Of course, German people come to us, so every nation is welcome to our organization. Thank you. Besides that too, we do a lot of uh, programs and the G20 has been one of our um, programs that we did this year and we started doing the African Day. We also host the African Day every year, Advanced Week March, and I think there was an introduction and also podium discussion concerning G20. So we're taking it from there and we had it at sea. Um, or Huffins University, that was uh, the C, G, C, C, what is it? C? The Civil 20. Right, right. Dialogue from and, and, thank you. And so now we continue the G20 from here today. And as we all know, from Friday, it's going to be very busy in Hamburg because we, going, we will receive very important people. And I don't know if you, all of us, we have the same mind to welcome him. That's our Trump, the Trump, and the... <laughs> well, I don't need to say much, but so please, let's go ahead. The time is running, thank you. <laughs> um, yes, I just introduced a little bit of what we are planned on the uh, Compact with Africa in a nutshell. It will be um, a promotion trailer by the Finance Ministry of Germany. Um, it's just about the Compact with Africa in a nutshell, so it's... Yeah, you also be aware of what uh, others are doing. And um, also there will be a short presentation of impressions from the protests against the G20 partnership conference in Berlin from 12th and 13th of June uh, this year. And also, of course, the results of the G20 uh, Africa partnership conference. And we will also present their website for us just to be more informed, everybody I don't know everybody is on the same level of knowledge, and so it's also necessary to know what is planned from uh, the governments uh, and the G20 governments. And also at the Civil 20 conference, uh, 18th and 19th of June in Hamburg, there was, like uh, Samara said, uh, there was our workshop also, and for example, a uh, person was there, Martin Sankeu, uh, from uh, network African Interchange Development Network, and he has made a consultation in 40 African countries, and uh, we have a film also showing his uh, uh, statement on that in uh, the Civil 20 conference. 
and also we will summarize the uh, things of what happens also at the African Day and some important statements, others, other statements from um, <coughs> apart from Martin Sonkeo um, at the Civil 20. Yes, and then after that, somehow a lot of input. Um, I hope everybody can join our discussion and um, we will talk about that, what we have seen. And so as we will film and document, it will be also a whole um, documentation for us. We want to present to Af and to link to African uh, partners, to African countries, uh, and so also the civil society organizations, grassroots level organizations will see what we have talking about and what is this planned. And so you, I hope that you will contribute to that too. Um, sure. Right. <laughs> and so let's uh, start also with a uh, trailer from from um, the uh, finance ministry. On the other hand, this is the IMIC website, imicenter.com in Hamburg, if you want to look into it. So let's start. Africa's population is growing, and societies in Africa are changing. Africa has become an important strategic partner in a globalized world. The overall picture is characterized by positive change and opportunities for sustainable development. Africa's growing population means greater potential for growth. Growth that is underpinned by a larger workforce and a bigger market. Pressing challenges remain. For example, in many regions, only little progress has been made over the past two decades with access to electricity. Only 35% of the population have access to electricity. There's also room for development in transport infrastructure. By 2030, another 440 million young Africans will have entered the labor market. These young people will be searching for jobs and, more broadly, economic opportunities. Thus, investment in infrastructure is needed to facilitate growth, create jobs, and improve living standards. This requires African economic leadership, entrepreneurship, and private sector engagement. Governments and the private sector have to work together closely to create a prosperous future for the people. In order to further deepen the cooperation between G20 and Africa, the German G20 presidency launched the G20 Africa Partnership. The partnership fosters sustainable development based on African ownership and the creation of a conducive environment for investment. The priorities of our joint efforts include the creation of jobs, empowerment of women, and investment in health and education. The G20 Africa Partnership helps to achieve the goals of the African Union's Agenda 2063. The Compact with Africa initiative is an important pillar of the G20 Africa Partnership. The Compact's aim is to create attractive conditions for increased private investment. We want to facilitate cooperation between African countries, international financial institutions, G20 partners, and very importantly, potential investors. We need the countries of Africa if we are to achieve the goals of the 2030 Agenda. Through the G20 Africa Partnership, we want to invest in our common future. G20 Africa Partnership, investing in a common future. Yes, um, this is what the um, responsible a finance ministry of Germany is, is trying to promote and um, um, it's part of the G20, as you know, it's part of the G20 presidency of Germany um, to push forward the uh, agenda on 
the African continent and the so-called G20 partnerships with Africa. And uh, they also mentioned a lot of things, um, especially the private business framework, the macroeconomic framework, and uh, also other things is yeah, the recommendation to improve. And the thing which is, no, uh, which is new, they say, is that in overall African approach, that um, the governments of the African countries decide if they want to be part of that initiative and that they also can decide in which framework they want to work and that they can choose about uh, the areas and sectors they want to draw attention um, in, to invest to private investors from anywhere. Um, all right, this is uh, what the um, officials want to say and want to see. Um, so, but there are a lot of people like here to, um, to protest against it. And as you know, maybe there has been a demonstration in Berlin just two days before the, um, or ahead of the G20 partnership conference, approximately 1,000 people, uh, 1,000 protesters took part in a demonstration uh, at the center of Germany's capital, Berlin. And under the slogan for global freedom of movement and self-determined development, uh, they spoke out against the building of borders in Africa due to European migration control policy, arms, business, corporations from the G20 states and the ruling development policy aggravates the misery in African countries, they said. And also the conference venue has been blocked for has been blocked for a while at the second day of the G20 partnership conference approximately 50 people from the same protest alliance tried to block the main entrance of the venue and they have been detained shortly after by German police um, this just to be aware of what has going on until now and the major uh, initiative um, venue has been uh, the G20 Africa Partnership Conference. And um, yes, this is the official website. I have also, if you want to write it down and to look, to make your uh, the inquir inquiries for yourself, um, you can look there at their website, compactwithafrica.org. And there you, um, find a lot of different um, things. For example, what is going on there, what, uh, what kind of, of countries take place, uh, and not take place, what kind of countries participate. And up to now, it's seven countries. As you can see here, Morocco, Tunisia, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Ethiopia, and Rwanda. And um, they decided to come and go to the G20 finance ministries and um, to, the presidency, to the presidency and say, oh yes, we want to be part of it. And also just a quick, yeah, clarification of the official application procedure for a country to participate in the compacts with Africa. Basically, the governments are saying the application, it's yeah, at first the application procedure, um, basically it's open to all African countries. Um, interested countries take part in a structured dialogue, so-called structured dialogue with local representatives of international financial institutions, uh, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, and the African um, Development Bank to examine in this structured dialogue whether the compact uh, initiative is suitable for the country. So if they want to be part in that or not. 
And if they stay interested, the country's finance ministers um, write to the respective G20 presidency. Now this year it's Germany, and um, next year it will be Argentina, and so on. And um, the countries write to them. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, he he has not been yeah, yeah okay yeah he has not been here uh, at, as when we said and um, it's just about the complaint uh, a complaint that uh, you don't uh, should um, um, should film the audience um, with their faces just from behind um, or us so um, and if the podium is filled hopefully with everybody then <laughs> it should be filmed too. And we will not use uh, the footage um, with your faces, so you can be sure about it. Um, and it's also important for everybody who is filming. Okay, right. Um, where we stood. Um, the interested countries write to the respective G20 uh, presidency. And then the presidency invites African finance ministers uh, to G20 meetings. And there, we, uh, there they um, talk about, make the dialogue further on. And afterwards, the compact investment partnerships are negotiated between the African countries, the international financial institutions, and other partners, uh, e.g. individual G20 countries. So we will see, or you have or you will see that uh, the main figure are the financial institutions and then there are coming uh, in the process of negotiating so-called bilateral partners. For example, Germany has introduced um, three special partnerships on a bilateral basis with three of the seven countries and uh, these three of the seven countries are Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana and Tunisia. So just ahead of the G20 conference in Berlin, the uh, development minister of Germany, Gerd Müller, has introduced this special reform, so-called reform, uh, reform partnerships. Right, um, that's the way the official application procedure uh, is. And at the moment, just to let you know about the current state of affairs of that. Um, at the G20 Africa Partnership Conference in Berlin, just yeah, two, three weeks ahead, and uh, just a uh, uh, ago, <laughs> two or three weeks ago, um, for example, the countries uh, signed a memorandum of understanding, and the so-called country teams um, with a specific African country and other financial institutions, members, coordinators of that financial institutions, and um, also bilateral partner countries are particip participating in that country teams and going to negotiate. Uh, and now it's important on what they negotiate and uh, they negotiate on special investment plans and try to look through uh, the African countries' agenda. They should propose, but maybe, I don't know if the International Monetary Fund is saying, no, that's not so good, maybe you choose another area, then the country might be um, going to that area. So maybe it's not all the kind of a free choice. Um, but nevertheless, there are important areas um, specified by the country where they want to draw attention to financial investors and where they want to try to um, put investments through private-public partnerships almost. Um, yes, and for example in Ghana it is like this that they uh, want to have agricultural, agriculture and agribusiness, petrochemical industries they want to improve, um, and energy and the financial structures, 
Um, it's very. I recommend also to read everything um, on this prospectus very carefully, what the countries want, um, and um, also to bear in mind that there are also other um, initiatives, other things, other contracts already in place with, for example, the International Monetary Fund in Ghana, and uh, that it's not out of a gray cloud, these prospectors, it has to be seen also in a longer time frame, I guess. Um, right, and if you go to such a prospectus, you will see what the country has suggested in Berlin to investors in somehow closed investor round tables and not every round table where have been open and um, right so this is the macroeconomic framework what they want to achieve business framework financing framework and what uh, they have also in regard to to the areas and at the end of these papers you see partner support for the reforms so it's actually before there is a promotion for an investment in an African country, actually the country has to make their reforms. So it, now you can see what um, the reforms should be. And um, some are good, some are not so good, and uh, it depends on what is, will be written in the contracts which are negotiated right now. So we will see at the end, maybe at the end of this year, um, what will uh, directly happen and how much the government of this country, of these countries, will, um, yeah, get through these expectations also. And um, this is about the results of the G20 Africa Partnership Confidence, and now we want to make the or present the film. Um, from uh, the Civil 20 workshop, which is uh, from Martin Sonkiu, as I said, uh, the uh, yeah, member of an African interchange development or African development interchange network, uh, and it's uh, yes about this, and you will see what he said. Mr. Sonkiu, maybe you could also introduce more about your consultation paper, the content of your consultation paper you have made with uh, at least um, in 40 countries, African countries, at least with 60 um, in, uh, NGOs. And what they are saying, what do the African NGOs say? Thank you. I'm smiling here because if I was giving you the raw material that came from the that came from the consultation, you would hear a lot of things. You would hear things like it is a conspiration against Africa. Uh, I just picked one from all my people. So just to summarize how much difference you you can have in the views that came from the consultation. But the good thing is that we, we managed to, to have that consultation. We consulted uh, with uh, a number of African civil society coming from all the five regions of, uh, seven regions of Africa. And what comes out of this is, as the paper says, a lot of caution. That is, Africans are, they may welcome the, the compact, but they are cautious, as I said earlier, they are cautious about the real content and the real perspectives and what Africa can really expect from this. They are very cautious about the way this initiative, we, we say, is new, is going to be different from all what they saw before. So many Africans are asking, how is this going to be different from what we've already seen? And the idea of a conspiracy comes to be supported by the fact that, and you heard it from what Nancy just presented, that we, we, 
We again see behind all of this, we see the World Bank, we see IMF, we see international financial institutions. Afghan people are very, they, they have a very, I mean, the, the history of those institutions that we have in Africa is not a really good one. It's a sad one sometimes, in some places. When we, re, when we remember the, 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 the structural adjustment plans, it was very, very painful for many Africans. There are countries where you, you got to a situation where public servants saw their salary cut to the tent and even more. And uh, 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 social services really suffered from this. And out of this social adjustment, we never saw poverty step back. So this is, this is not the good situation. And when we hear that the, the IMF and the World Bank are behind the compact, you understand how much Afghan citizens can be. We say cautious just to, for you to hear things that are nice. So what comes from the results is really that bad. But there is still some hope, because some of those who are consulted still want to see from the compact something that could be good for their people. And they are hoping that they, they, they can work with their leaders, with their governments, to be in a better negotiating position. Because they think this is about international cooperation. That is engagement of African governments with the G20. Now, the idea for, for the civil society is that they need to work on a better way of negotiating with these people. And I think that's the most important thing in the result, that is looking at it as something which, in perspective, would be made good. But I'm going to deliver to you what the results were. The consultation was on five, five key questions. That is, we wanted to find out what the general opinion of Africans is about the country. Also, we wanted to, to find for the if those who participated, if the compact was something useful. The third thing was, what is it to us, or what is it the impact of uh, that initiative on human rights and other issues that we, important issues that we have in Africa? Then we wanted to know how much the people were aware of not just the, com the compact, but of the G20 engagement by African governments. Then the, the last question was about uh, the missing, what is missing in the So from the, those five questions, we got five, we got six, six key outcomes. That is summarizing the priorities and expectations. Number one was that whatever is coming behind the compact, African citizens want the initiative to make sure that the investments that are coming forward are aligned with the African Agenda 2063. That was the number one. Number two is about rationalizing. Rationalizing anything that has to do with the new perception, that is the private sector coming in, with ODA, because they think that public resources still need to be handled somehow and there need to be a good combination between those two, that is, between public investment and private investment to go in the direction that satisfies the African people. So that's what's number two. Number three is the involvement of Africans, I mean African citizens, in the conversation about the, the compact. So they, 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 they think that it is necessary for African citizens to be part of this and they want to believe that the compact is not something which is only tight and which is not open to adjustment. So they, they want that African citizens should be part of that conversation. Number four is about the mechanisms. The mechanisms that are going to be used in the compact, they want the mechanisms to be clear, to be transparent, and not to be the kind of mechanism that will bring new problems or that will add to problems that we have had before, like the debt problem, the debt issue. So they say they want to see good mechanisms in, in the company. And uh, 
Uh, number four was about harmonization of all initiatives because the compact, the, 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 this new initiative comes after many other initiatives. And there are initiatives that exist, like initiatives between Africa and China, Africa and Japan, Africa and this. They want some kind of harmonization to make sure that those initiatives really are directed toward the real expectations of the people. Still, they, they mentioned the Agenda 2063 here. And then number six is about transparency and accountability. So African citizens want to see in the compact some kind of tool that would allow them to be part of an, a monitoring and accountability framework. And those are the six key results that we have from the consultation. Thank you. through it because <laughs> it would be better for the documentation also. And if you like to introduce yourself, it would be also good. If not, it's not the problem. Hi, my name is um, Charlotte. <laughs> I'm here for private interest. <laughs> and um, I would like to know, uh, yeah, I just had a short question concerning the, the video we just, we just saw. Um, who did they ask? Um, they presented this um, this paper about the consultation, and I just didn't understand um, yeah, who was consulted. Who are the African citizens in this context? Right. Where? Um, it was a week-long consultation um, in which 60 Very representatives good. of uh, African civil society organizations, which they work together. Um, I'm not able to name them at the moment, but for example, another um, yes, you want to add <laughs> another people also sitting there in the front, but maybe also Eva uh, Hanfstengel uh, from Bread for the World is able to clarify this um, very better than me. <laughs> Yes, um, because I was um, copied in all the email exchanges, my inbox got full <laughs> with all of this. Um, these are civil society organizations that work together on the economic issues in several countries, African countries, Rwanda, Senegal, and so on. And one um, organization also involved is Europe, uh, Arbodat, based in Zimbabwe, but also an international network in Africa. These are economics, but also these are not basic NGOs, but more economic uh, you know, uh, networks working in Africa. And also in Cameroon. Yes, in several countries. So, for example, one of that is the Economic Justice Network in South Africa and elsewhere, or also um, the Third World Network Africa, which is, has a, a main office in Ghana, for example, has been a part of the consultation and a lot of other um, NGO participants. Um, right. Yeah. Do we have other questions right now to understand for, for knowledge reason to understand better what has been said? Yes. Before we start the panel. Hello. My name is Elena. Um, I just wanted to know um, what is what what happened with this consultation? Like with the outcomes? Does it like? Is it uh, related to the negotiations um, of the partners and the countries, or? Um, yes, the, the, the aim is that uh, this consultation paper is also a kick-off to a better involvement of the civil society organizations in African countries as a whole, but in particular in that uh, countries. And also, again, maybe <laughs> Eva 
can say more about because um, they also support a planned conference in the autumn this year also. Yes, um, it's a very good question. At the moment there is no link. It is um, uh, so that civil society is not involved in any of the negotiations. They are not involved in, in the conferences, the official ones. And that is one of the key demands they are having. Um, and I think this is very important that civil society gets hurt in Africa. And that's why they uh, wanted to start a process which hopefully Bread for the World, where I'm working in Berlin, can support that civil society get organized in Africa to monitor what's happening. One of the key points. It's not yet happening. Is there any question? Um, I hope there will be some more questions um, and uh, I just want to present then another film um, to watch um, from mainly from the African day but also um, or, uh, about the um, about the uh, civil 20 workshop and there are some more aspects of the critic towards the uh, G20 complex uh, inside. of G20 should be laid clear. Is it going to be to ensure that Africa produces for itself? Is it going to be citing factories in Africa and making sure the factories employ Africans and give them a, a technical training and enable them to produce for themselves and eventually take ownership of their own property and their own resources and their own countries? Excellent. If it is about producing in mainland Europe, and exporting all the things to Africa. And then Africa see the attraction of running there rather than staying at home. G20 will not serve the purpose we are looking for. Just a quick clarification, using an example. If you look at a country, a country like Kenya, I don't know how many Kenyans are here. Recently we heard in the news that milk, a liter of milk in Kenya is more expensive than a liter of petrol. Why? Because the president owns 90% of the milk industry there. Now, if you come here and you say you want to invest in milk, in a milk company in Kenya, it's very likely that you're going to invest to share a partnership with the president. Are you giving money to the private sector? Are you giving money to a very politician? This is this where the problem is. Uh, let me just quickly add to that, uh, which is unforgiven. Uh, Africa has close uh, to 70 percent of the actively engineered economic sector in agriculture. Yet Africa imports 350 billion food items. This should not happen. This should not happen at all. It is a shame and we have to get our act together. Because it is a problem also of the African elites that the state of Africa is so poor nowadays. And I, uh, I'm working in the grassroots level and I'm supporting women's projects, especially professional qualification for women in the rural area. And I must say, what I don't like with the Compact for Africa is that infrastructure, it will be linked ex again to export industry. And I think we need an infrastructure which is related to the situation of the jobless use, to the situation of the jobless of, uh, le of, uh, or less earning women in the rural area. And there will be no foreign investment in the rural area because there will be no the profit which can be organized, for example, in, uh, the, uh, in the towns of Kenya. What they are saying is, you need to change your regulations so that they protect the investor. Nothing about protecting the, the, the citizens, nothing about the impact on development, nothing about SDGs, because as we have said, they have already concluded that PPPs will deal with it. You know? The projects, you know, on, there has not been appropriate consultation on project selection. There has not been appropriate consultation on the project preparation and acceleration and replication process. 
There has not been enough consultation on the contract. And finally, there has not been enough consultation on what the African Continental Business Network is doing, which wants Northern pension funds, you know, to buy into all of Africa's infrastructure so that, you know, low-income, medium-income Africans can pay old people's pensions in Europe and the United States. Whatever is coming behind the compact, African citizens want the initiative to make sure that the investments that are coming home are aligned with the African agenda 2630. So African citizens want to see in the compact some kind of tool that would allow them to be part of an, a, a monitoring and accountability framework. Kwame Kuruma said that Africa can only shatter its call when they are united and they responsible for their continent, I think the issue of Africa don't really consign the West. trailer also to uh, that uh, workshop and I hope you feel invited <laughs> to come um, in front um, and to be part of our discussion uh, more on and uh, yes maybe to start with I just want to ask again Mrs. Uh, Eva Hamstengel from Bread for the World to be part of our discussion um, here in, in, in the front and um, <laughs> that we all can sit here and um, yes and I hope somebody else will join us now <laughs> somebody else will join us soon uh, because the, I can imagine that there are still questions I can imagine there are still um, statements under your skin wants to come out <laughs> And um, yeah, the first question, if I have Stegel, is uh, you said about the non-involvement of the civil society. Um, what are the plans? Um, for example, the demands from Mrs. Tsong, uh, from Mr. Tsongkheo about the um, yeah um, better involvement about the accountability framework. So to say, yeah, not only a business and macroeconomic framework, but what uh, is very, very important on this accountability thing. Um, <clears throat> before I start, I have to apologize because of my voice. I just got a cold. So normally my voice is totally different. <laughs> but I didn't want to stay at home. You can imagine, miss this solidarity summit. That would have been too bad, so I tried to survive. Um, but uh, first of all, my name is Eva Hamstengel. I'm working in Bread for the World in Berlin. Um, I'm working in the political department, um, and my focus is finance issue, fi uh, financial architecture, financial regulation. Um, I come to this topic, co uh, uh, Compact with Africa, because of the whole um, a challenge uh, private investment and uh, make bankable projects. And coming to your question first, there is no ac accountability mechanism. That's the problem. Um, this whole initiative was invented by the German finance ministry. And it was a dialogue then with the chancellor's office and with then, in the second step, with the development ministry. The first name was Compact for Africa. And the initiative was how do we challenge some of the money that is here looking for profit, looking for more interest rates, to Africa because it's a more risky area and you know the risk premium where they are, you, if you invest, invest in more risky areas you can make more profits. And here we have the challenge 
our pension funds, it was mentioned in the film, and also companies, they have a problem with the low interest rates, so they, they are looking for investment. That is one main reason why this initiative comes from the, develop, from the finance ministry in Germany. One motivation, that's very negative, you know. But on the other hand, you have to see also the chancellor's office and our chancellor. She has uh, the challenge of the refugees. She has the challenge of, you know, we have election year. So she has to ch show that Germany is doing something for development in Africa. And this combination was seen as perfect. You know, we have the profits here for the, you know, uh, profit-seeking industry in Germany or in G20 countries. At the same time, you can show the public, yes, we're doing something to promote development in Africa and help the situation in some countries so that refugees stay at home. This is just in a nutshell, you know, some of the motivation we found out. Um, but perhaps there are questions on this. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> um, yeah. Is anyone ready to support us? Thank you. Great. Yeah, just introduce yourself and... Yeah, my name is uh, Sarah Bürger and well, I work in political education, but I don't know if that is important right now. Yes, it is. Political education. So, um, what I see here when I listen to what people have to say and why this compact is being made is, for, well, at least for me, in my perspective, is a colonial structure. It's a neo-colonial structure and I don't understand how people still can like act in the same way as they have done for centuries, century, exploiting um, people, exploiting working force, exploiting resources, and it's always profiting like the Western countries, and I also see that here. And I don't see a true um, political will to actually um, create something together with African nations and people. I just see a lot of self-interest and really egoistic behavior. Would you clarify that on a specific uh, topic or area, or would be also helpful? I think. Like if you, for example, we look at agriculture here. Um, again, agribusiness is being fostered, and it has been like this for years. The um, World Trade Organization, the IMF, have been uh, introducing a lot of different programs, structural adjustment policies, to um, which is actually also history in colonialism, where you. Um, where European countries decided what has to be produced for the needs of European countries and not for the needs of um, African people. Subsensus um, agriculture has been um, eliminated or like at least uh, it, it's not like before anymore. So there's a lot of dependencies, so there's monocultures, there's mechanization, and it's important to look for in, um, innovation in agriculture also, but there's also a lot of great traditional uh, methods that have been um, destroyed by like the yeah all the forced implementations here and the political adjustment um, and in the end it was yeah I think it it's still leading to a lot of um, problems as we already saw in the video like the dependencies on the food market for example yeah um, to support what you were saying is um, we, um, we are a little group of NGOs um, who had a dialogue with the finance ministry people who initiated, who are responsible for this compact with Africa. And uh, it's true, there is a bias towards big investment, big companies, foreign direct investment, and what is missing is the development of regional markets, the uh, support for small and medium enterprises, and so on. So there is really a problem there. And what, what the African NGOs are demanding is if there is a combination of big business, which in combination with developing regional markets and smaller business, if that is a combination and a very well-made plan, then it would function. So in principle, we are not against big business if it doesn't destroy the small ones, if it's not against it, if it's not just about um, um, developing export-led industry, but um, you know, internal markets have to be developed. And that's something why we think we should support and, and, and see um, that um, uh, civil society in Africa um, monitors what is happening on the ground. You know, if development is really helping the 
what's the film is wonderfully saying, um, to implement this sustainable development goals. Is it really true they're doing this? Poverty eradication with big business, is that happening? I would like to see the civil society to tell me, yes, yes. Now the poor children are going to school, we have free hospitals, that's all financed by big business and they make even profit with it. My doubts are there, right? So I think the first thing we have to really see what kind of development is promoted in Africa. Is it helping all people, the whole society, or is it just you know, promoting a small elite? And there was a criticism of Nancy Alexander there in the civil 20s saying, well, or other people also, uh, Christa Hansiuplak, saying, well, the elites also are a problem in Africa. The, you know, the ruling elites, that's, it's not so easy to say, well, everything is wrong when you talk about, uh, you know, a need for a business-friendly environment. Some things are right, you said it too. You need more legal, you know, um, um, basis for industry to develop. It's not possible in a corrupt state, right? On the other hand, you need, uh, I don't want to talk too much. Yeah, so I stop here, talk about taxation later, and some, some, some specific problems here. Do you have, um, just also want to uh, ask, ask you uh, about the positive developments you want to have, you want to create. Um, some very important thing is to criticize uh, ongoing things, but also to develop uh, alternative strategy, an alternative um, option for countries or let's say grassroots level NGOs or whatsoever you are dealing with maybe in uh, different countries? Well, my uh, focus is also a little bit on looking at what happen, happens in Germany and to always say Africa is corrupt is one thing, but we also have elitism here and we also have lobbies here and we are the big producers of weapons and I think uh, we, ha we are doing a lot of environmental damage and the uh, gap between rich and poor is growing. So we have a lot to focus here. And for African countries, I can just say, well, ask the African countries and the people there and don't decide everything from Europe. Well, uh, I do support your opinion. It's really good because, you see, when you look at the African nation, what I would suggest is we first need education. Uh, you did mention that there is free education, free hospitals. I don't, I'm not 100% sure of that, because there, when you go to the rural areas, which we spoke much about that also, there are the people that they never even had chance to go to school. And this is reality and it's the system. So before we can get there, we first have to tackle education. This is what I would say. You want to also recommend something? Or? Yeah, but maybe you can come uh, just here to the chairs and then contribute here. It would be really good. Hello everyone, it's nice to be here with you this afternoon. Um, I have to apologize for coming late because I didn't know this area of Bamberg. <laughs> so we're going around to find a place myself and my friend for Abba. My name is Magdalene Ihoi Kumera. I come from Cameroon. I've been living in Hamburg for the past 30 years. I belong to a um, women's group here in Hamburg called Frauen Courage. And we have been working with international groups all over the world to, for uh, women's rights, women's freedom, women's untadrukun, and so on. Um, in Africa, where I come from, is a big, big problem, personally, that I see. Before they can start anything in Africa, they have, to, first of all, to look into the corruption. It is a problem. And I think that with the uh, G20, if we have to say anything, G20 is for the, for the rich people, and um, they now have 
thought about the forgotten continent, Africa, because for years they have not looked into African problem, but now that the whole world is upside down, they are all now turning to go back to Africa and to see what they can do in Africa. Maybe to repair the damages that they have made in Africa, or to collect the remains that they have in Africa to collect. Because it is very, very important that we as human beings, we have to live together with love, faith and hope for the future, for our generations that are coming. But when I look around now, I ask myself, what have the young generations now have in front of them? They don't know the left, they don't know the right. It's not only in Africa, it's all over the world. So it is a problem for the uh, CEOs and the, uh, the, 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 the big rich people who want to go to Africa. We need building, we need uh, uh, education, we need, we need uh, um, technical schools, we need what the people can stand on their feet to do, training institutions. Not only uh, uh, everybody who go to school is a, a wise person, but the one also who did not go to school has also a brain. And he or she can also do something. So we need to educate these people, but we cannot do it because our hands are tied with the Africans that are here. We try to help as little as we can, but our government is our problem. Because so long as you are long in Europe and you come back there, they don't give you a chance to do anything. Somebody like myself, they will put in prison because I cannot close my mouth. And these are the things that make the Africans, they are hardworking people. They can under, un, undergo all kinds of uh, situations in which they find themselves. But we need our government to work with us to build our nation. And we can only do that if the white people, the colonial people can help us because all what is happening in Africa, they also learn it from Europe. Because you have the European people who are also working with the blacks to teach them how to make corruption. Corruption is all over the world. It's not only in Africa. So we cannot keep on pointing fingers that uh, the Africans are this or that or that. It's all over the world. But when people learn to live together, work together, build together, then we have a better world in which we live in. Thank you very much. Yeah, and you also maybe introduce yourself and uh, yes. to contribute. With the microphone, please. Hi, Streams. Uh, I want to point out three main subjects which I uh, neglected in the general discussion about Africa. First, there is no solidarity among the leaders of the African continent because they are dependent on the uh, industrial nations, the great the big industrial nations which exploit the African continent. And they are more interested in their own personal benefit instead of being interested in the development and in the solidarity of the African leader of the African countries. This is would be the first step that should be done that the Africans really united in one spirit to stand up against the exploitations which is done towards the African countries. And the second point, Europe and the United States are fighting with financial and currency uh, problems which bring down their own economy. Therefore, they are not able to do for Africa what needed to be done. And the third point that the, is the exploitation, which I mentioned already, of the countries, especially the southern countries of Africa. This has to be stopped. 
and there is no real endeavor to be seen that there would be interest to stop this exploitation. Many uh, examples could be mentioned. For instance, the fishing around the coast of the African continent, which is done by great uh, uh, factory ships of America, Europe, and even the People's Republic of China. How the People's Republic of China exploits the African continent today is another subject. And this is one example, and this ought to be stopped. And therefore, uh, we need to bring to a general conscience these three pro problems I mentioned. I would like to respond to what you said. Um, this is really a, a big, big uh, problem. And um, I'm, I don't want to praise the G20, but they have an initiative, a working group on anti-corruption, where they invited civil society. So I could see that uh, they really try hard to work against corruption, even though our countries are also, you know. Uh, that's f uh, totally true. We have it everywhere. But this is a uh, major impediment against development. All, all kind of. So um, when there is this compact with Africa, first of all, uh, also in response to you, it's not that it is imposed on Africa. It is clear that this is just an initiative that is free and it's an invitation, um, our government assures, uh, to African leaders who can say no. You know, and in fact, Germany was disappointed that so few countries um, said, hello, I'm interested, only seven, right? In the beginning, it was only five, and then, you know, they promoted a little bit, say, oh, aren't you? Know? So it's seven now. They sent an invitation to all of them, you know, and they expected a much bigger comeback. But they were not interested. They said, no, we don't want, which is okay. So it's an African leaders who were in the Compact with Africa conference in Berlin, and um, I was there, fortunately, I could see this, they were standing there being, being very proud and saying, well, we are interested in the money. We want this kind of development. It's the African leaders saying that, right? So civil society has to talk to their leaders you know, and say, uh, we have to watch what kind of development do you want? If you get this money, fine, but under what conditions? You have to go into details to avoid exploitation. Right? And therefore, we need a strong civil society in Africa to look on, uh, uh, on the hands of their governments. Right? And what I find a problem is, is the incentive issue. So some governments said, yes, we are there. We are fighting our corruption. We want to have a business-friendly environment. We, are, we see the problem of not having a legal basis for, for, for um, um, investments to come, which is also a problem. You know, this legal uncertainty, uh, you need to, to know that the conditions are still r uh, um, the same in, in two or three years, and not that the government sees the whole company and all the money, you know. Y you will not have create development with this. And um, um, lastly, in, also in Germany, it's not just a big bloc trying to exploit Africa. I don't see that. It's um, also, um, I, I, I see a friction between people from the development ministry, for example, they call it a new partnership with Africa, and they really mean it, you know? They really see on, on the same level that African uh, leaders, but also civil society talk, and, and we have a real exchange. So is, there are constructive fights between our ministries, meanwhile. You know, time has changed. It's not the same like in the 50s or in the 60s. And that's why we, I'm encouraged to involve as far as possible for civil society in those discussions. And we really was fighting with some people in the finance ministry and saying, ah, your views are from yesterday. Talk to your, view, to, to your colleague in the development ministry. They are totally on our, our, our line, on our, uh, you know. But it also has to be uh, true that uh, it's only possible and workable um, with transparency in it. Uh, I would say with uh, at least more transparency as it is up to now, because for example, me, for example, as a journalist, I'm not getting the answers I want to get. So, I mean, um, there are some things they say it's in the process, we just negotiating and just like this, we can't say so much up to now, 
also the big G20 um, head of states meeting conference is there and we can't say anything before that <laughs> and so on, yes, but uh, there is no transparency at the moment. There are different initiatives and also not only bad initiatives, um, but also not only good ones. Um, yeah. Or do you want to react also again? Thank you very much that um, you have been able to give us a little height line on what the government is thinking about. And as an African woman, that the African government, they came to Germany to have their meeting. But personally, I did not really see what came out from this meeting. Normally, when they come like that and they go back, the citizens themselves don't even know what is going on. So how can then the government now work with the citizens or with the allies in the, in the community? There are a lot of Africans that have their private businesses, they're trying to contribute as much as they can, but then the government is always in the middle. So it is also that the people in power, when they want development, then they have to reach the royal areas and work together. But that is not happening in Africa. And that is where the problem is, to my opinion. Because if you cannot speak to your, your neighbor, you cannot say your mind, the quarters of the African countries are living under dictatorship from the colonial masters till now. And for that sake, a lot of people cannot open their voices to say, oh, this is what we want, because they are afraid to be killed overnight. There's a lot of problem inside there that unless the people who are at the top are ready to, to, to open their hands to everyone, then things can move smoothly. But if they are not ready to do that, then people will keep on dying unnecessarily for hunger, for malnutrition, on everything that you can think of. Thank you. Thank you, also for It makes me always a little bit sad also to think about these things. Um, and I also agree on that there's elites, um, that, but that's actually like, of course there is elites in Africa, but they are cooperating with elites somewhere else, and especially in Europe and, and, and the US, so yeah. Um, but I wanted to come back to the foreign ministry because I don't really agree on that. There's a, a huge difference between the finance ministry and the development ministry, although I see that there's some good intention, but in the end, I always want to have the question there, who is deciding for whom? And in the end, also the, for, uh, the ministry of development here is always telling African countries how to do their, their job and how to do, make development without letting them decide for themselves. And it's always the same, follow our model and then you will be prosperous like, like we are here. But it's not working, it hasn't been working for centuries now and it won't be working like this. We have to have some um, autonomy, we have to have people decide, that, as you say, civil society movements, they know what they want, but there's no voice that is being heard actually and that's the same everywhere in the world, and I think that we, we, fa we are facing a bigger crisis, but Africa is among the places and regions in the world where it affects people most. Um, but also just want to illustrate um, different standpoints, for example, from the Federal Ministry of Finance in Germany or the Federal Ministry uh, of Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, for example, in the energy sector. In the energy sector, the compact uh, also promoting big infrastructural things. It's necessary, I would say. Who wouldn't say it's not necessary? Uh, because in some parts, the electrification rate is about 60-70%, but in some parts, it's about less than 20%, the electrification, which is, in my opinion, the basis of economic uh, development also. 
And um, but for example, the finance ministry is promoting it, and also the country leaders uh, are trying to have these kind of investments. But there are different approaches. For example, from the Federal Ministry of Economic Co Cooperation and Development, they just uh, launched a new initiative uh, on last week, Tuesday, um, 27th of June, they uh, promoting uh, with that uh, so-called Green People's Energy for Africa. So what they uh, want to improve is local uh, energy projects where the rural areas can can be a part of it and also the people there it should be a people-centered approach and the people should partly invest in their own value uh, production chain so like this yes and so out of this uh, energy um, which is owned then by the people and the communities or communal structures like this, like it is in the so-called uh, Bürgerenergiegesellschaften, Bürgerenergiegenossenschaften here in, in, in Germany, for example. And it's a different approach. And they plan, I just uh, say, to develop these centralized energy structures in rural regions. Uh, and they plan to have, in the next five years, they plan to have to establish 100 people's energy partnerships with Africa that communities and individuals from Germany can get involved in directly, but with an ownership of the African uh, citizens. So, that there are different approaches, even by the same German government. So, and this is how to, uh, to illustrate um, the different opinions and strategies they have. Also, the Ministry of Finance, uh, the Ministry of Education and um, Science having, a Afri having an Africa strategy for more cooperation between universities and so on in African countries and here. So there is a lot of things happening, but um, I want to ask also if it's all bad or not, because I don't think so, for example. It depends on the approach you are going forward with. Let me, let me first ask the audience, is there any contribution, any opinion? Community organized um, uh, energy projects or, or community organized um, uh, sanitary projects and, and so on. All this I know since a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if how, how good they work because um, they, you need the, um, the kind of uh, um, technical. Um, um, qualification in the community. It, it has to be organized from the community. You need the. Uh, is there something like a uh, project like we have in Germany, Handwerkskammer or, or like that? So, so you 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 um, maybe a good idea to implement, implement a system like the Handwerkskammer or like that. To, um, to get a uh, qualified um, technical um, workers f um, um, in the community. Mm -hmm. If you have it, you can build it for yourself. There's no problem to build a, 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 a power plant. If you if you are technical, there's no problem. You just build it. Um. I totally agree, and we are also supporting um, community-led development, right, or bottom-up approach and, and all of this. But we are not talking now uh, about all development initiatives uh, with a focus on Africa. Um, if, they are much more than just Germany. Um, the G20 
um, uh, gave a task to, develop, uh, to the World Bank and IMF for the Finance Ministry meeting in Baden-Baden in March to put together all big African initiative in one big report and evaluate it. This document is there, it looks a bit like this. I tried to read it, I tried hard. Um, it's, it's full of you know, negative and positive um, you know, evaluations. There is a lot going on and there it's very diverse. So we have this as a whole seminar we have to do, right? It takes us months to understand what is going on and there are really different, different initiatives, different motivations, different big organizations behind it or small. So this is a whole area that's not now for half an hour to discuss. We, we should focus on compacts with Africa. Now, that's the theme here, and that's one specific element. And I agree on the little word S in compacts. It's not a compact, which is a whole, which, uh, which is a one initiative or one you know, set of ideas coming from the north to exploit the south. That's not true. The compact with Africa idea is, in fact, many little compacts of business with African leaders or African uh, governments. I saw at the conference in Berlin, there were you know, the main statements of African leaders, of, of the World Bank, and Christine Lagarde from IMF was in there, all saying, you know, nice words. But then, in the afternoon closed, and the, the, the issue of transparency is a big one, there were little, little rooms, papers there, pens there, and signs were saying, Senegal, all business were there interested in Senegal, come here into this room. We were excl excluded, for, uh, of course. Um, so what's happening, and the little compacts that are happening are agreements between big, uh, some business, international Canadians with their other in business companies with there, to go into a room and just talk to Senegalese or to Cote d'Ivoire, other, other government leaders, um, about certain conditions, about agreement in order to have a business-friendly environment. Right? That's, that's, these are the compacts. Now, on human rights, I heard um, Schäuble, our finance minister, saying, well, we are reluctant with Ethiopia because of human rights, religious dictatorship, and so we have a hard time to, to, to you know, um, agree to their interest to join this initiative, and we sent them first to the World Bank IMF because of human rights standards. They have to understand that there are certain conditions, but the conditions here, I, I must say, I agree. Because you cannot allow all dictatorships to take just you know advantages. So it is very diverse. It's positive and negative. And the issue of transparency is very important. Because the main thing, and you see it only in, in the slide that was shown before, a little word, and you have to work on and you have to really look at into this. This is PPP and de-risking. These two words are very important. PPP means public-private partnership. And it was said in the video, in the, in the film, uh, we need close cooperation between the governments and the business. What is it? What is de-risking? It's shifting the risk from the private sector to the public. It means if profit you know, goes down from the company, well, if there's an, let's say, a natural disaster or an economic you know, um, <coughs> going down of expected profits, the whole risk goes to the tax of the government to the budget of the government. The, budget, uh, the government, in the end, has to step in and pay for the, well, the lack of profit that the company agreed and so on in these compacts. This is an important point because that reduces, in the end, the budgets of the governments for social expenditures. Huh? So that is about PPPs and de-risking. Um, uh, even, and, and here, a good thing about our finance ministry people, I, I couldn't believe it when they are talking in front of the business, a whole group of business in Washington, in a room, I sneaked in, you know, nobody saw me, you know, I had the sec, se, same outfit, and I could hear them say, well, they don't like the word de-risking. And he said, we need an, uh, a political environment instead of that, because also our finance ministry people don't like the shifting to the public sector because they see a future debt crisis coming. If some government leaders who are, you know, too, uh, let's say, after the money and expecting the big push for their elites, you know, negatively termed, they 
write some contracts which are so risky that in the end the budget goes down and then a debt crisis occurs which will affect the poorest in the countries. So these are the dangers and we have to really watch. I think together, North and South, civil society in Africa and, and us, we have to work to closely together to look into those risks. Into um, um, so, so if I understand it right, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of risk investment um, environment. Um, like dot .com, uh, is it dot .com Africa or like that? Um, we, we had it um, in 2000 um, with dot .com in... in, in a big investment the, bubble. The, 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 the same for, for, for Africa and uh, in, as risk investment. Yeah. But um, to, to develop for, 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 for standing in, against it, um, uh, civil society has to be organized. And I, I would, would like to have an overview what kind of civil so, uh, society uh, movements are there and how, how good they are work, working and so on. And in different countries. Mm -hmm. Council, can you uh, give the microphone? Okay, um, my name is Hildegard Scheu. I'm on the board of the German critical NGO uh, World Economy, Ecology and Development with a space uh, in Berlin. Uh, I'm from Bad Homburg, near to Frankfurt. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned a few demands to the compact. So what I was missing so far in this discussion, and we are almost at the end, is really that we come up with some very concrete demands or requests or uh, statements from civil society in Germany to our government because we can't change dictatorships in Africa. I mean, we, we can lobby somehow, we can support civil societies in Africa with different organizations uh, are doing that for the world and others as well. But uh, what we can change is something here and I think that we should concentrate on in the next 15 minutes or so. Maybe just 10, but uh, you should start with it. So what, what is your uh, um, requirement? What's your demand from REIT, for example? Uh, well, I, I think we also have to look in trade policies, for example. I mean, on the one hand, we are uh, providing money for development and having this compact is also in this area and it has a few critical issues. But on the other hand, we are destroying markets, for example, with uh, the EU agricultural policy and so on. So uh, in, in this area, there's a lot, a lot to do. And um, yeah, we, I, I feel um, as, a, as a German NGO also, we should start from what we can influence. And uh, so regarding uh, uh, the compact, um, it's definitely looking at accountability, uh, asking for accountability and getting some policies in which uh, s support uh, participation of civil societies uh, in, in different African countries and so on. Uh, there's uh, uh, Angela Merkel, Chancellor Angela Merkel recently visited some African countries and uh, the uh, reproach which is very often made to African countries, not only from the German government, is to tell the African leaders to stop corruption in their countries. How can we uh, demand this after we have given them ourselves this bad example that uh, corruption uh, is not exterminated in our own countries. We have to do this first to give a good example that should be uh, an, uh, a good example for African leaders to continue. It is, the point is that either, neither in Africa, nor in America, nor in Europe, nor in other industrial uh, countries which exploit the African continent, there is nowhere uh, to be seen that there is a real endeavor a, a real, for a real change of the situation. 
I remember in, on the Africa Day uh, recently, in May of this year, there was a podium discussion and a representative of an African country, I forgot his name, he said, I have hope, but I am not optimistic. And this, uh, this statement I want to underline. Very good, uh, just short and simple. <laughs> uh, there's also the question to you, Mrs. Hamschenger, uh, about short and simple demand. In, in addition to the two good demands, uh, I have five points. Uh, I try to be very short. Uh, I mean, these are very important, anti-corruption and trade, um, fair trade. Um, my demand would be the first one, um, tax corporation. We have to stop the race to the bottom. We have to stop the world incentives, meaning we don't tax the big companies, right? Come to our country, a country, not go to others, you know, we don't tax you or very little. We have to stop that because these <coughs> taxation have to go into the budgets and uh, help the countries to develop, right? So tax corporation means um, that countries get together on a regional basis or you know, globally will not work, but you know, to agree on some low taxes for the big countries. Companies, first thing. Second thing, to avoid future debt crisis, we need a debt workout mechanism, which puts some losses to the companies. It cannot be that all the losses will be put to the public, you know, to the budgets again. Companies have to pay for the interest they get for the profits and take also the losses when things go wrong. So we need a debt workout mechanism, a fair one. And we have Alasia and many initiatives to work on this. That's the second. Um, the third is we need, in turn, when there is a crisis happening, we need social protection flows in the countries to protect the very poor, poor to pay for debt or whatever financial crisis is coming. We have all these austerity measures. We see Greece, what is happening in Greece, you know, and this reduction in the social area is unacceptable, we think. So we need a social protection flow for the poorest in all countries. That can be paid. It's not impossible, right? And the last point, second last point, <laughs> is um, I agree to the whole development paradigm. It's wrong. We need to get, get, get away from this growth paradigm saying growth is, is this goal. It's not the goal. Development for all is the goal. For the whole society is the goal. And that's why we need to work together with the civil society and see what kind of development is supported here. Right? Does it promote an elite? or does it promote uh, the community-led development everywhere? So that's the way of, of the kind of development. Lastly, a fundamental criticism against G20. Here we join all the protesters here. Um, it's very good that G20 has, or Germany brings Africa into the G20, into the, the loophole, uh, into the picture. But that's not what we really should have. We should strengthen the United Nations, where Africa sits and you know, uh, has the same right to talk about and decide upon uh, decisions made and not be invited here and there by elite club like G20.